Assalamu alaikum dear brothers and sisters wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'd like to begin by extending my warm congratulations to all of you as we celebrate the birth of the awaited savior, Al-Imam Sahib al-Asri wa zaman who will achieve what previous prophets have all aspired to achieve and that is to establish justice on earth to establish divine law on earth allowing for human beings to prosper in this earthly life and in the hereafter so we ask allah Azza wa Jal to make us among his his supporters and his companions uh, i'd like to welcome you all to another uh, session on the tafsir of surah al rum we've been discussing it for uh, a few weeks now surah al rum is the 30th chapter uh, of the Holy Quran. It is a Meccan surah based on its style and its contents. It's heavily focused on the Islamic belief system. And we've reached, we're almost at the halfway mark. There are 60 verses that make up the surah and we've reached verse number 26. So if you have a copy of the Quran, uh, please uh, follow along with us. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وله من في السماوات والأرض كل له قانتون To him belongs whoever is in the heavens and on the earth and they are all devoutly obedient to him. If you recall my dear brothers and sisters, the, the previous verses that we covered discussed certain aspects of Tawheed, certain aspects of God's oneness. And the previous verses focused, for example, on Tawheed al Khaliqiyya, the idea that God is the sole creator, that nothing can independently create anything without his leave and his permission. So that's one aspect of Tawheed, Tawheed al Khaliqiyah, that Allah is the sole creator. Nothing has the authority or the ability to create independently of him. Another aspect of Tawheed that we've covered in the previous verses is Tawheed al rububiyya that he is the sole provider and sustainer meaning that nothing can provide or sustain independently of Him. So even though we sustain ourselves with food and with oxygen and, and there are so many, so many things that we need to keep ourselves alive, that those, the food and the drink and the oxygen, those are simply the means by which God is sustaining us. So those, even those things that sustain us, are not able to do so independently of him. So he is the sole sustainer, he is the sole provider, the sole cherisher of everything uh, that exists. And therefore, so far, when you look at Tawheed al-Khaliqiyya and Tawheed al rububiyya the idea is that nothing that we need God to come into existence, and we also need him to preserve our existence. So he is the one who brings us into being and at every single moment he enables us, he sustains our existence. In verse 26, there is another dimension of Tawheed that is mentioned. And this is what some uh, theologians call Tawheed al-Malikiyya, which is the oneness of ownership. And this means that Allah is not just the sole creator. He's not just the sole sustainer and provider, but he is the sole owner of everything in existence. You know, we may conceive of a creator, you know, sometimes we as human beings, we create things, but we don't own it. We might sustain something, but we didn't create it. So Allah creates, He sustains, and He is the sole owner of everything 
in the cosmos, everything in the universe, everything in the creation belongs to him. It belongs to him. It, it's his property. He's the owner. And even this the notion of ownership, when we speak about the human context, you know, we are not the real owners of anything. You know, ownership from a human perspective, from a, from from the perspective of the created, is is essentially a a mental construct. It's a social construct. It's not a real thing. We don't own anything. It's just it, it's something that the mind has. It's a relationship that the mind has created. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is the owner of everything in existence, and this has a very a very terrible effect on our outlook. You know, when we come to terms with this reality that everything belongs to God, it changes the way that we respond to both try to both blessings and and the the loss of those blessings. It changes the way that we receive blessings and, and the way that we receive and react to trials and tribulations. If you are given something know that, that that thing that was given to you belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even if it is the closest thing to you, even if it's your own child, even if it's yourself. You know, sometimes we forget that not only do the things that we possess belong to God, but we ourselves also belong to Him. And this is, you know, encapsulated in the, the verse from Surah Al-Baqarah where we say, Inna lillah. Inna lillah is an admission of ownership. You're admitting that God is the ultimate, the sole owner of everything. He owns you, He owns your children, He owns the land that you walk on, the materials that make up your home, the everything in the universe belongs to Him. He is the sole owner of it. Now, of course, in the Arabic language, men usually refers to intelligent beings, rational beings. But in some cases it can be used to encompass both the, the animate and the inanimate, or the, the intelligent, the rational beings, as well as the, the irrational beings. So he owns whatever is in the heavens and on the earth. Now even though the verse literally says he owns whatever is in the heavens and on the earth, it also implies that he owns the receptacles as well, meaning that he, he doesn't only own what is in the heavens and what is on the earth, he owns the heavens and the earth and everything that they contain. And then at the end of the verse, not only does Allah own everything, not only does everything belong to him, Allah says, Kullu lahu qanitun. They are all devoutly obedient to Him. Now, what is meant by this phrase? Kullu lahu qanitun. Because if we, if we think about it, if we say that men, you know, walillah, men fi samawati. Well, of to him belong whosoever is in the heavens and the, on the earth. If we understand men to only refer to rational beings, that means the verse is speaking about angels because they are rational beings. It's speaking about human beings because human beings are rational, and it speaks about jinn. These are really the different, the main, the the, the rational creatures. If this is the meaning. How do, why does the Quran say all are devoutly obedient to him? Because the word qanit, it, 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 it basically means that it's a type of obedience that is done from a place of devotion. But we know, you know, just from experience, from the world around us, we see that there are many rational beings who are disobedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how do we how do we reconcile this, this apparent contradiction? On the one hand, Allah says, Kullu lahu that 
everything is devoutly obedient to him. But we see most, I, 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 can, I don't even need to say many, I can say most of humanity, many jinn at least that we know of, they, they disobey God. So not only are they disobedient to him, because the verse is saying not only is everything obedient to him, but they are devoutly obedient to him. Now, let's begin by speaking about the, the irrational creatures. Meaning, by irrational, I'm talking about beings that, that don't possess aql, that don't possess intellect. It's interesting that when you look at the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He speaks about the heavens and the earth, in Surah Fusilat, Surah 41, verse 11, Allah says, it's speaking about the creation of the universe. Then, and the, so the verse says, And then he turned to the heaven, turned to the sky, and it was a smoke, it was gas. And we know that, you know, if you look at the creation of the, the universe and the formation of galaxies and solar systems, you know, uh, they could be described as, as, as gaseous bodies that eventually took, uh, took form. In any case, فَقَالَ لَهَا وَلِلْأَرْضِ So he said to it, to the sama, to the sky, and to the earth, اِئْتِيَا طَوْعًا أَوْ كَرْهَا Come to me, meaning, obey me, come to me willingly or unwillingly. Allah'an, voluntarily. Kalahan, involuntarily. So come to me willingly or unwillingly. Qalata ataina ta'i'een. They both, the sama and the earth, responded by saying that we come to you, we obey you willingly. And this is profound, brothers and sisters, because not only, so everything must surrender to God, but it seems that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has even given the heavens and the earth. Now, outwardly, God's command must be, must be realized. They have to obey. But the way that they're going to obey is left up to them. So you're either going to be begrudgingly surrender or you willingly. That is something that is left to the creation. And what is amazing about this verse is that Allah is telling us that everything, it doesn't only obey me, but it obeys me from a place of love and devotion. It voluntarily obeys God. So, so not only does everything in existence obey God, but it does it out of love and adoration for Him. In Surah An-Nahl, Surah 16, verse 49, Allah says, وَلِلَّهِ يَسْجُدُ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ So here, the word ma is used. So, to God prostrates. Everything in the heavens and in the earth. And there is not a single creature that roams on the earth. So everything does sujood to Allah. Now, of course, we don't understand the prostration of, of all of these entities, but we do know that prostration is the highest form of submission. That everything devoutly obeys God. It does it willingly. So there, we can't say that the, the sun or the moon or the mountains or the cells in your body are begrudgingly obedient to God. They do it willingly. So from a Quranic perspective, the, in everything there is a certain degree of consciousness. Now, going back to the original problem that we encountered with the verse. 
If Allah says that everything is devoutly obedient to Him, the question is how about human beings? We know that not, there are many human beings that don't even believe in Him, let alone just describe them as devoutly obedient. Now, to be devoutly obedient implies, you know, the, the concept of obedience and disobedience only makes sense if there is a law that exists. Because it doesn't make sense to say you obeyed or you disobeyed if there was, if there was not an order, if there was no law to obey or to disobey. So obedience and disobedience needs to be understood in the context of a divine law. Now, there, there are two types of divine laws. One type of divine law, everyone obeys and submits to. There, can no, there cannot be any breach with respect to certain divine laws. And then there are other divine laws that can be breached, that can be uh, disobeyed. So we have number one, al qawanin tashri'iyya. These are the legislative laws of God. The legislative laws of God are essentially the do's and the don'ts of the Sharia. Allah says, pray. You know, don't drink, don't commit zina, don't commit murder, don't lie, don't be unjust. We call these laws the legislative laws. Those laws can be breached. Those laws can be broken. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us free will. So it's not that we have defeated God or we, we have overcome Him by breaking his legislative laws. But there is a second category of law that no creature can breach. And that is Al-Qawaneen Al-Takwiniyya. These are the creational laws or the, the natural laws that are in place. This is not something that can be breached. So, when Allah says, Kullu it's referring to those creational laws that cannot be breached. Now you might be able to disobey God and not and not pray, for example. But can you can you disobey God and breach a, a natural law? Can you basically you know prevent yourself from aging? Can you can you reverse the the law of gravity can you make the sunrise from the the uh the west there are certain can you change the the the, the design the physiology of the, so there are certain things that you cannot change these are the laws that cannot breach cannot be breached so when allah says Kullu lahu qanitun, everything is devoutly obedient to him Even when it comes to those legislative laws, by disobeying those legislative laws, you are still within the parameters of his creational law, which is the fact that you have free will. Kullu lahu qanitun. And qulut is, is a very beautiful expression. You know, Ibrahim السلام, in the Qur'an, he's described as qanit right? with, res with respect to the legislative laws. Because the, the creational laws are they're out of our hands. Maryam is known as a qanit. So this is a type of full devotion. So the way that Ibrahim worships God and the devotion he has towards his Lord is similar to the devotion of all of the inanimate objects to God. There is, it's a love relationship between the created and the creator. So, if so, and this is what we mentioned in the verse that the heaven, the, the sama, and the earth they obey God willingly and voluntarily. 
Verse number 27. وَهُوَ الَّذِي يَبْدَأُ الْخَلْقِ ثُمَّ يُعِيدُ وَهُوَ أَهْوَنُ عَلَيْهِ وَلَهُ الْمَثَلُ الْأَعْلَى فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ It is he who originates creation, then brings it back. And that is most easy for him. And to him belongs the loftiest description in the heavens and on the earth, and he is the mighty and the wise. Now, we this has already been mentioned in the previous verses, so I'm not going to repeat it. But there's one part of the verse that I, I want to bring your attention to. So, Allah is al mubda He is the one who brings things into being from nothing. And here, you know, one of the problems of the mushrikeen was that they believed that God was a creator. They believed that He brought things into existence. But they had so much trouble uh, with the concept of resurrection. They were always grappling with the possibility of resurrection especially after the bones deteriorate and there's, there's essentially nothing left. Here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that bringing it back is most easy for him. Now, unfortunately, some translators and even some mufassirin of the Qur'an, they say that this verse is saying that Creating you was easy, and recreating you is even easier for Allah. Now, there's a problem with explaining the verse like that. Because when you say creating man was easy for God, and recreating him, resurrecting him is even easier, the implication is that you have already created degrees of difficulty, or degrees of ease. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all-powerful. Everything is easy for Him. Nothing is more difficult or more easy. Because as the Qur'an says, إِنَّمَا أَمْرُهُ إِذَا أَرَادَ شَيْئًا أَيَّقُولَ لَهُ كُنْ فَيَكُونَ His command, his, when He wills something, He says, be and it is. The object, whatever is being created, whatever is being done is irrelevant because it's all easy for Him. There is nothing that is more easy for God to do than another thing. So, Ahwan, so even though this follows the pattern of Afwal Tavlil, it's the idea, because even in the Arabic language, you can say Ahwan, and the meaning is Hayyin, that it is easy for Him. Creating you from nothing, bringing you back into existence, is all the same. Now, you and I, we have trouble comprehending this. Because it's difficult for us to fathom being so powerful that creating the universe and creating a single cell, there's no difference. Now to us, there's, it seems that there would be a difference. The amount of energy that, would, that would, it would take, the amount of power and work it would take to create a universe versus creating a single cell. Logic would dictate that Creating the universe is more difficult, but to Allah Azza wa Jal, it's the same. There's no difference. And here you find, in the middle of the verse, Allah says, وَلَهُ الْمَثَلُ الْأَعْلَى It's difficult for us to understand God. You know, one of the, and I think I, maybe I've mentioned this in our previous uh, sessions, and it's the idea that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have a very paradoxical relationship with Him. On the one hand, we know Him. He's very close to our hearts. We feel Him. We feel His presence. We are closer to man than his own jugular vein. He's so close. Now usually when someone is very close to you, you should be able to describe them. But if I ask you, you can describe God to me. You don't know what to say. So on the one hand, he's so close and he's so intimate. He's so intimately close, yet when you want to speak about him, you have nothing to say. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's close to our hearts, but he's very far from our minds. And 
when the verse says وَلَهُ الْمَثَلُ الْأَعْلَى trying to understand God is impossible understanding his essence there's only so much that we can know about him and وَلَهُ الْمَثَلُ الْأَعْلَى to him is the loftiest description in the heavens and in the earth now, whoever is in the heavens, whoever is in the earth to him belongs the loftiest description and this, you know, if, if you want to know what is the meaning of وَلَهُ الْمَثَلُ الْأَعْلَى to him is the loftiest description Surah Ashura, Surah 42 verse 11 is really the best description of God and that is لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ that nothing is like him in fact, we have a hadith from Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam where he says, Kullama mayyastumuhu bi awhamikum. Whenever you try to differentiate him and to think about him, fi adaqi ma'ani, no matter how precise you are trying to be and how much energy you expend, how much mental energy you expend to define him, to capture him, anything that your mind produces is مَخْلُوقٌ مَصْلُوعٌ مِثْلُكُمْ مَرْدُودٌ إِلَيْكُمْ So anything that comes to your mind, which is your attempt to define God, is not God. Why? Because whatever your brain, your mind conjures, the concepts and the images that your mind conjures, is a creation of your mind. It's makhluk. It's makhluk just like, so just as you are created, the, the images, the, the notions that are developed by the mind are mental creations. And God is not, he's not something that is created. I don't know if you can hear the, uh, the applause of the, uh, the banging of the, the pots and pans. You have to give people credit. So, and you know, this is another another ibra for us. That if, if non-Muslims can bang on their pots and pans exactly but to the dot on 7 p.m. And this is to show their appreciation to other human beings. Um, imagine how how prompt and how punctual we should be in our in expressing our gratitude and our adoration to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam, he says that whatever you whatever comes to mind, whatever you whatever your mind generates as a description of God is a meant is a creation is a mental creation. And it has to be discarded. It is not God. I want to share with you guys uh, a beautiful excerpt from one of the sermons of Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen in Nahj al-Balagha. And I really believe, brothers and sisters, that other than the Qur'an, if someone truly wants to know who God is, there is no one, of course, other than the Prophet, there is no one after the Prophet that can describe God better than Ali ibn Abi Talib. And the way that he describes him is that it's all admission that he's beyond our comprehension, that he's beyond our imagination, that he's beyond the reach of empirical knowledge. So Amir al-Mu'mineen, he says, Qareeb, he says, of course, لا تدركه العيون بمشاهدة العيان that the eyes, eye, physical eyes cannot perceive him. ولكن تدركه القلوب بحقائق الإيمان but he is witnessed, he is seen by the heart, he's seen by the heart that Allah subhanahu he's so close to Allah, it is the heart, the eye of the heart that witnesses God, not the, the physical eye. And then he says, قَرِيبٌ مِنَ الْأَشْيَاءِ غَيْرَ مُلَامِسِ That Allah Azza wa Jal, He is close to everything, but not by physical proximity. بَعِيدٌ غَيْرُ مُبَعِينَ And he is so far from everything, but not through separation. مُتَكَلِّمٌ بِلَا رَوِيلٌ He is a speaker 
Allah speaks, He communicates, but not but but without reflection. You know, when I speak, I have to think about what I'm going to say. There, there's a there's a mental process that is happening as words are being generated by my mouth. But Allah Azza wa Jal is the one who speaks without reflection. Muridun bila himma. He intends. Allah intends. He has this quality of irada, but not with preparation. When you and I intend to do something, we, we make preparations, mental preparations, we make you know physical preparations. He intends without with no proper preparation. Sani'un bila jariha. Sani'un la bi jariha. That he molds, he fashions things but not with the assistance of limbs. لَطِيفٌ لَا يُوصَفُ بِالْخَفَا He is subtle. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He works in very subtle ways. That's why many tyrants, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removes them so swiftly. He operates very subtly. You know, Allah is very patient, you know. When, uh, when, as I mentioned before, when Bani, when Musa and Harun, when they made the du'a against Fir'aun, Allah answered their du'a. But forty years later, he was cast into the the Red Sea. And Allah is very subtle in the way that His will is manifested. So He is subtle, but but cannot be attributed with being concealed. Kabirun la yusafu bil jafa. He is great. But he cannot be described as haughty. You know, you know, when people become very powerful, you can't even talk to them. They're very arrogant and very they're unapproachable. But he is great, but he's not haughty. Basir la Yusafu bil He sees, but cannot be attributed with the sense of sight. Of course, Allah doesn't have eyes. Rahim la Yusafu bil Allah is merciful. But it's not that he, it's not, he cannot be described as having a, a weak heart. You know, you and I, we have mercy, but our mercy is different from God's mercy. Our mercy is not, you know, the, it's not when, it's not, you know, our, we, feel, we feel mercy when we pity another. Our heart softens. Allah Azza wa Jal is not like that. He is merciful, but not because of a faint or a weak heart. That faces bow before his greatness, and eyes, uh, hearts tremble out of fear for him. So, وَلَهُ الْمَثَلُ الْأَعْلَى فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ That to him is the loftiest description in the heavens and on the earth. If I want to put it very simply, it goes back to the idea of Laysa Kamithlihi Shay. That he is unlike anything. So Allah hears and we hear, but the way that he hears is not like us. We may have mercy, we may show mercy, we may be merciful. Allah is Allah's mercy is not is incomparable to our mercy. So even when you think that there is some overlap between human qualities and divine qualities, the difference is, cannot even be calculated. And then the verse ends, وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ And he is the mighty and the wise. Because the verse was talking about what? That he creates and he resurrects. To be able to create and resurrect, you have to have power. He's Aziz. But he's not only Aziz, he's also Hakim. He creates with purpose, with wisdom. There is wisdom behind everything that he brings into existence. Everything that exists, there is Hikmah behind it. You know, many years ago, I was taking a class, uh, this was in college, not too long ago, and we were taking a, a class on uh, I think it was biology or physiology, and, and someone asked the 
the professor about the appendix. And because people, you know, scientists until today, they don't really know. The, the, the appendix doesn't seem to have a, a clear function. That's why it can be re surgically removed and, and you're fine. You're not, uh, you won't be harmed. Now, this appendix is a creation of God. Can we say that it doesn't have any purpose? Now, just because we don't understand its purpose, it doesn't mean that it has no value, it has no purpose. It's not just, you know, some appendage, some useless uh, vestigial organ that was, that we inherited from our ancestors and it has it doesn't have any, you know, uh, function anymore. It's obsolete. It's not the case. Allah is an Aziz al Hakim. Everything that exists has a purpose. It's a reflection of His wisdom. And the reason why He brings things back to life. He has the power to do it, but there's also a reason why He resurrects. So bringing in things into creation, it requires power, but He also does it with purpose. And things are brought back to life for a purpose. So everything is done with wisdom and with purpose. The next verse, verse number 28. He sets forth for you a parable from yourselves. Have you, among those whom your right hand possesses, partners in what we provided for you, such that you are equal with respect to it, with you fearing them as you fear each other? Thus do we expound the, sound, the signs for a people who understand. Now this verse, when you first read it, it's a bit confusing to understand what the parable is. The idea here is that the Mushrikeen of Mecca, they believed in this higher God, known as Allah. They believed that Allah is al Khaliq. But they also believed in these lesser gods, these idols. Now, Allah subhanahu and they had this belief that each god had control, essentially owned a part of creation. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is saying what? He says, let me, he says, you, you are asserting, the mushrikeen are asserting that God shares sovereignty with the idols. Even though they admit that they are his subordinates, that they are lesser gods, but he is the master and they're essentially his slaves who have been given some powers. So Allah is basically saying that's a very interesting assertion. Considering that when you look at yourselves and the slaves that you own, Allah is saying to them that to the masters, the slave masters, does your slave own a part of your property? So all of these Meccans, they have slaves. Allah is saying to them that you are claiming that I share ownership of the universe with idols, that we're partners. The, the slaves that you own, you are masters and you have these slaves and you have your own wealth. Does the slave that you have, does he, is he a part owner of your wealth? So the idea here is that no one would envision a slave or servant having equal share in the master's wealth. And Allah is also saying that, are you, do you fear that your slave will have ownership and have sovereignty over your property and your wealth? No. It's, there's a, there's, there, that's the difference between a master and a slave. That you, you own everything that he owns and they own nothing of your sovereignty. So no one would envision a slave or servant having an equal share in the, in, in the master's wealth 
or fear that the slave would have an equal right to it. So if one cannot envision that state of affairs for one's for, for your limited sovereignty, you're applying this this idea, this division of ownership to God. You, you, you don't accept that your own slaves are partial owners of your wealth. You're claiming that these idols are partial owners of the creation. So here Allah gives them a very intuitive argument that to say that anyone other than God owns the universe is preposterous because there is no master and slave relationship that is known to you, the Meccans, where the master is put at the same level as the slave, or the slave has ownership alongside the master. Verse number 29, and we'll, uh, we'll conclude with this verse. بَلِ اتَّبَعَ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا أَهْوَاءَهُمْ بِغَيْرِ عِلْمٍ فَمَنْ يَهْدِي مَنْ أَضَلَّ اللَّهُ وَمَا لَهُمْ مِنْ نَاصِرِينَ Nay, those who do wrong follow their desires without knowledge. So who will guide them? Who, so who will guide those whom God has led astray and they shall have no helpers? The verse begins with Everything that has been mentioned with respect to the signs of God's his oneness, his, that he's the only creator, the only sustainer, that he owns everything in the universe, he's the sole sovereign. This is rejected by those who follow their desires without knowledge. You know, brothers and sisters, what's interesting about the Qur'an is that from a Qur'anic perspective, to follow one's desires is usually placed at the opposite side of obedience to God. So from a Qur'anic perspective, following one's desires is the opposite of following God or following the messengers of God. Now, what do we mean by these desires? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us with desires. Now, the Sharia guides and it governs and it regulates these desires. But human beings oftentimes, they, they allow their desires to completely overwhelm and dominate their lives. Whereby they overindulge, they transgress the limits. Now Allah has given us the, the desire for food, the desire for drink, the desire for children, the desire for wealth, the desire for intimacy, for companionship. These are all God-given desires. Desire comes from God. But Allah has set certain limit, limitations, that He has set, set certain laws that allow us to govern and regulate those desires so they don't destroy us. Because if the pursuit of desire is left unchecked, it can blind the heart. The heart becomes so preoccupied with satisfying these lowly desires that the heart becomes blinded. It, can, it no longer sees anything outside of its own self. It becomes blind to many realities. So, when you look at the Qur'an, succumbing to these desires in an unregulated way, overindulgent is very dangerous. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He speaks about the people of Jannah, when He speaks about the pious people, those who will attain salvation, what is He saying? وَأَمَّا in Surah 79 verse 40 to 41 وَأَمَّا مَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ وَنَهَا النَّفْسَ عَنِ الْهَوَى The one, Allah says, as for those who fear the status of their Lord. 
You know, you would think that the verse would have stopped there. But those who fear the status of their Lord, they'll be given Jannah. That a sign that someone has reverence for God is that what? That you prohibit yourself from partaking and indulging in the the desires that are prohibited. That you prevent yourself from indulging in those desires that run contrary to the Sharia. And even when it comes to things that are halal, you see brothers and sisters, the the Urafa, the, the mystics, they often say that, of course, you shouldn't eat haram. But in addition to not committing haram, you should even be careful about, for example, overeating, overindulging in the halal. There needs to be moderation. So you can't say that, look, I don't commit anything haram, but I'm going to eat without any, without any control. And no, I'm going to have no self-control. So even the things that are permissible need to be done in moderation, because when you become too attached to the the desires that relate to the physical body, you might be tempted to to commit things that are against the Sharia, because you're you're so focused on satisfying the needs and the desires of the body. So fear of God and and preventing and suppressing the illegitimate desires, they go hand in hand. Allah says, indeed, paradise will be their resting place, their their place of uh, their home, their residence. Imam al kazim alayhi salam, so I'll end with, with two ahadith, one from Imam al kazim and one from Imam Amir al mumin about this, this idea of ittiba' al-hawa. Imam al kazim he says, إِذَا مَرَّ بِكَ أَمْرَانْ لَا تَدْرِي أَيُّهُمَا خَيْرٌ وَأَصْوَبْ فَانْظُرْ أَيُّهُمَا أَقْرَبُ إِلَى هَوَاك فَخَالِفْهُ فَإِنَّ كَثِيرَ الصَّوَابْ Imam al he gives us a very beautiful rule of thumb. Whenever we are confronted with a choice, and we're assuming that they're both halal, so obviously if one is haram and one is halal, you have to, you have to you turn away from that which is forbidden. But let's let's say that you are confronted with a decision. And one of them is more difficult than the other. They're both good, but one of them is more difficult than the other. Imam al kazim alayhi salam, he says, look at your heart. Which one does your nafs, which, which choice is your nafs more inclined towards? So if you want to make a choice, ask yourself that my lower nafs, this nafs that has a, an inclination towards ease and comfort and self-centeredness, see where your heart goes, what your nafs is more inclined towards, and go against it. Because most goodness lies in going against the desire of the soul. I'll give you a very simple example. Imagine it's, imagine in, in a pre-coronavirus world, it's, there's a majlis, and you want to, you're making a choice. Should me and my family go to the masjid? Or should we listen to the majlis on YouTube? And you're able, let's, let's assume that you're able to do both. If you're not able to because of your kids are sick, or you're, that's a separate issue. But both are options. You're able to do both. 
Now your your nafs, now they're both good. They're both good. But your nafs most likely is gonna be inclined towards what? Let's just stay at home, you know, the just the idea of getting dressed, you know, getting the kids ready and driving and spending gas money and the time and traffic and all these things. Your nafs is more attracted to what? The easier choice. The choice that brings more comfort. It's easier to do. Imam al Kabam says, make decisions based on what your soul is more inclined to and do the opposite. This is how you strengthen, this is how you develop taqwa. This is how you subdue the evil tendencies of the soul. And this is a, this just takes practice. You know, sometimes, let's say you're you're craving a, a, a certain food. It's halal, and you you want it, and you're desiring it. Eat it, but then stop. Eat only a quarter of it, and go eat something that's less delicious. They may say, "Why should I do that?" But the purpose of this is to train yourself to go against your desires. Because if you're able to resist even the things that are halal, you will develop strong, stronger resolve when it comes to going against the nafs when it wants you to commit haram. And I'll end with this one hadith from Imam Amir al muminin where he says, Man hawa, Whoever follows their desires in an unchecked, unregulated way, Whoever becomes immersed in the pursuit of desires, a'ma, one of the effects of blindly following in and always giving in to your physical desires is what? You become blind. Now, obviously, you don't become physically blind. The heart becomes blind. It's not able to perceive certain truths, certain realities. Wa'asamma, it becomes deaf. There's there is spiritual blindness that takes place and spiritual deafness. And you will become a humiliated person. You know, people who who are who are, who can't control their, their urges, their desires, they're not people who are noble. They're not respected. People who are addicted to alcohol, they're addicted to sex, they're addicted to food. They're not respected in society. They're humiliated because of this addiction. Wa and finally Imam Mir al Mumin he says following desires blinds you, makes you deaf, humiliates you, and it misguides you. It misguides you. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal protection from from this sort of misguidance. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen wa sallallahu ala Muhammad wa alihi tahirin. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Any questions or comments? In, in verse 26, uh, when we, it says that everyone is uh, devoutly obedient to Allah, what is uh, the word? I'm sorry, you cut off. What is the word what? Uh, what is the word devoutly mean exactly? Like, could, could, what are the meanings of the word devoutly? Could instead of loving obedience, could it mean something like flawless or perfect obedience? It could be. So, so Panut, Panut, it means uh, It means to obey, to humbly obey, to humbly obey. Meaning, it's it gives the so it, so it, it can so it encapsulates all of these meanings that it's you know perfect obedience, uh, devout obedience, you know, when you're devoted to someone, there's an element of love. And that's why I referenced the verse from Surat Fusilat, uh, ayah number 11, where the, the sama, the sky, the heaven, and the earth, they obey God 
ta'i'in, meaning voluntarily. So there's this element of desire, a desire to obey God. Uh, and this is all uh, captured by the word unus. So perfect obedience, loving obedience, humbled, uh, in a feeling a sense of even a sense of honor and not even seeing it as a favor you know one of the you know when we say that in ibrahim kana ummatan qanitan lillah that ibrahim was qanit ibrahim was so devoted to god because he saw nothing but god you know even him, even himself he he saw himself as being virtually non-existent in the face of the majesty of god everything vanishes when you are in the presence of God. So all of this is conveyed by this word, Anati. As far as the heavens and hell being willingly or unwillingly, it's, it's hard to even imagine what it could mean to, for them to obey unwillingly. Can you maybe talk a little bit about that? So, <clears throat> so yeah, you're, you're right. Even to to think that something would obey God unwillingly. I mean, you, you can imagine, for example, the people who, who uh, you know, the, the, the sinners or the kuffar, the irrational beings who have violated God's legislative laws. In the hereafter, you know, their, their obedience to God, meaning that them going into hell you know, when Allah commands them to enter how, that command is not a tashri'i command. It's not a legislative command where they can breach. It is a taqwini command because hell is most compatible with their nature. So there is, you know, people don't go into hell willingly. That's why Allah is always saying that they're cast into it. So that's maybe one way that we can, we can uh, comprehend and, and imagine unwilling obedience to God. You know, when, for example, when people enter the hellfire, they, you know, they're, they're drawn to it because of their nature, but it's, there's also this, it's a begrudging kind of uh, surrender to God. Does that make sense? Uh, a bit, yeah, it's a little bit more surprising to see that in and it's, it's a little bit more surprising to see that in the context of um, inanimate objects. And they inanimate willingly so, a, so, right. so, you know, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, says, obey me willingly or unwillingly, what does it mean for an inanimate object to unwillingly obey God? Is that even possible? That's a good question. I, I'm not sure if, if that if that's actually possible, but it, it wouldn't make sense for for God, for Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, to to say, you know, obey me willingly or unwillingly. If obe of unwillingly obeying God was not a possibility, so the fact that 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 uh, that distinction is made by Allah Azza wa Jal Himself when He speaks to inanimate objects seems to indicate its possibility now whether now it may never materialize but it's within the realm of possibility so because these inanimate objects are aware of god they have a ma'rif of allah azza wa jal, that that doesn't happen but theoretically it, it would be possible it seems allah Any other questions or comments? Yeah, that's how I'm going to There is a WhatsApp message or an article which is going around about uh, Surah number 74, which talks about number 19. So they are relating that number 19 to COVID 19. So next time, you know, if you have time, you can just clarify that. That would be much better. I, I mean, I can clarify it now. This is 
again, th this is what, these are conspiracy theories. See, th this is the problem when, when we, uh, when we take knowledge from people who are not ulama, you know, so that, that ayah is not a reference to 19. Even when, you know, many, many years ago, there was this argument that one of the ways to prove the miraculous nature of the Quran is, is that everything in the Quran is divisible by 19. But the problem is, if you want to apply this theory, you run into problems because some, some parts of the Quran don't fit that mathematical model. And therefore, the man who devised that theory ended up saying that part of the Quran was missing. Or, you know, there are, so, you know, I think we should refrain from, from making these uh, speculations. This is why the Quran always tells us that we should not make any claims without evidence. So unless we have an authentic tradition from the Prophet, from the Ahlul Bayt, who are really the only ones who are authorized by Allah Azza wa Jal to give us access to the inner meanings of the Quran, this is all, you know, Rajman Bil Ghayb. It's just shooting in the dark. And it's, uh, so yeah, so the Surah 74, whatever ayah you mentioned, is, is not, uh, is not a reference to COVID-19. Ancient uh, number 19. So, uh, uh, next time, uh, whenever, uh, you know, we have to see, and then we do uh, come across the eye of uh, Jahannam. Yeah. And uh, the guards there on Jahannam. So, if you could just... Um, yeah, inshallah, we'll, we'll, we'll speak about that one day. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, 19... Are, the, are the, the keepers of Jahannam? What is what did the keepers of Jahannam have to do with a virus that is in dunya? There's no way. There's no relationship. It's it's you know, I I, I don't uh, you know when people you know show me things that say oh look at the number of times this was mentioned in the Quran. It might be interesting, but we can't say definitively that that these these numerical references are pointing to certain realities today. We don't know. But inshallah, one day we'll speak about this idea of uh, of nineteen with uh, with respect to uh, the keepers of of Jahannam. That's another discussion. That's not it's not related to to COVID nineteen. Thank you very much. Jazakallah. Thank you, especially this night, you are in Abdullah's and everyone, all those who are suffering. There's a request from one sister who attends uh, the free proceeds regularly. Her son is showing symptoms of COVID and right. he's, nine, he's 30 years old and she's uh, requested you special dua for her. And Sean, I'll, I'll, I'll make dua for him and I'll make dua for all of you. May Allah Azza wa Jal keep you all safe. And uh, you know, I pray that Allah gives us the, the tawfiq to, to witness this month of Ramadan and all of the and, and the, and the months the months of Ramadan in upcoming years, may Allah grant him a speedy recovery for the sake of Imam Zain al Abidin, who was the the ill one in the land of Karbala. So please uh, pray for me, pray for for everyone uh, on this night. And if if you can, brothers and sisters, we only have two weeks until the month of Ramadan. Try to fast as much as you can in the remaining days of the month of Shaban. Try to give charity. You know, spend a lot of your time throughout the day, whether you're doing household chores. Most of us are home most of the day, and we have a lot of dead time. So if you have free time, uh, try to recite istighfar as much as you can, because istighfar has a way of, of lifting tribulation, and we're definitely living uh, during a time of uh, tribulation. So with that, brothers and sisters, we will, uh, inshallah, continue our discussion uh, next week, and uh, please pray for me. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.